Hello! This video is Linear Equations in Business. In this video we're going to see a whole bunch of examples of how linear equations, as simple as they are, are very extremely useful in the world of business. Okay? So one of the things that you may be familiar with in business is the concept of depreciation. Whether you're a business major or anyone else, you know that if you buy a new car, it starts to go down in value. Same thing happens to a house, to a computer. A lot of things when you purchase them, they just start depreciating or losing value over time. The easiest way to model this loss of value is with a linear function. Okay, so my first example here is going to be the depreciation of goods. In this case, I'll use of a car. Let's say that I bought a brand new car, it cost me $30,000, and every year it depreciates by $1,200. Is this realistic? Maybe not. I've heard before that people say as soon as you buy a new car, when you drive it off the lot, it's lost half its value. Well, it's not going to lose half its value every day, so obviously that's not constant loss. That would not be linear. Um, but again, this is going to be the simplest type of model that we can make, is that it just loses the same amount every time period. And here I'm going to say the new price was $30,000. And let's just assume that it um, loses... $1,200 per year. Okay? So in this case, I'm going to give you the equation for the value of the car. I'm going to let x equal the number of years since the purchase, since the original new purchase. Okay? And the value of the car, I could call it anything I want. Um, maybe I'll call it y. y is going to be the value of the car um, after x years. Okay? So let's get an equation here. The value of the car after x years is going to equal the original $30,000 that it costs and then it's losing $1,200 for every year that I own it. So this is the equation for the value of the car in dollars. Okay? I've got a couple of simple questions here that I might be curious about. Um, for example, what is the value of my car after 10 years? I'm pausing because I want you to solve it out, so at any time, you might want to pause the video to try to solve out questions like that. So what is the value after 10 years is my question. Well, remember, the x variable is years. That's why I wrote over there very clearly to myself, so I remember x is the number of years and y is the value of the car in dollars. So when they ask me for a value after a certain number of years, I know the answer will be found by plugging in whatever number they gave me for the x variable. Okay? And then when you do that out, you should get 18 thousand dollars left in that car after 10 years. So that's the answer to a question like that. Um, but maybe you want, you know the other thing, like for example, what if I know the value is ten thousand dollars, how many years has it been? Okay, so let's look at the difference between these two questions. I'll call this one part A. The value after 10 years, 10 years is a value for x. It's a number for x. What about when is the value equal to $10,000? If you state a question like this, you can see that you've actually been given a value for y because you've been given a dollar amount. And y has units of a dollar amount. Okay, so now we've given a value for y. The other thing that hints to you that you have y and you're looking for x is the question is when. And remember, x is a number of years. x has a time unit, number of years. And the question word when means that I don't know how, how long it's been. Okay? So in this one, we know that y is equal to 10,000. When we go back to the original equation here, it's so important that I keep track of that because I want to know where to put the numbers I've been given. 
Now I know y is equal to 10,000, so I'm going to put the 10,000 right there, and then x is the thing that I'm looking for. Okay, so I get an equation like this, and you'll just want to put all the x's on one side, put all the numbers on the other side. Um, you can do it either way, so if you bring over the 30,000, subtracting 30,000 from both sides, I will get this statement right here. You can see I've subtracted the number 30,000 from this side and from this side. That's how I got to negative 20,000. And I've got the minus 1,200x from the equation there, dividing by the 1,200 on both sides, and using your calculator will give you x is approximately 16.67 years. I have to use the approximately equal instead of the strictly equal to because this is not an exact answer. The exact answer was 16 and two-thirds years. That's a repeating decimal, 666, six, six, so I rounded it off to two decimal places, and so that's approximately 16.67 years before it's only worth $10,000. With the same type of logic, I could figure out how long it would be until there's no value left in the car. Okay? So that's my first application there, but um, a very common application for business is going to be that of uh, cost, revenue, and profit. So let me introduce those terminologies to you now. Um, we have cost revenue and profit. These th three things usually go together when you're running a business. These are the things that you mainly have to keep track of. How much is it costing me to do whatever I'm doing? How much money am I making out of it? And what is the difference between those two quantities? That's my take-home income. That's my profit. Okay? So let's say I'm a sort of a toy maker and seller. So I'm doing both at once. I'm making the toys and I'm also trying to sell the toys. And um, the cost is, let's call it C of X, uh, 1.5 X plus 756. Okay, so let's say I'm given a cost function and hopefully you can recognize this as a linear function because it only has X to the first power. The cost to make the toys is given by this. Let me define my variables really quick. My x is going to be the number of toys, the number of items. Okay? And then the c of x is going to be in dollars. So I will write the cost in dollars is that value right there. Okay, and I'd like to just pause to explain the two different parts of c of x here. You can see there's one part attached to the x, and there's one part that doesn't have any x's, and usually we call these two different things. This number right here, we will usually call our variable cost. Variable cost. What it means to say 1.5x, where x is the number of toys, is that these toys are costing me $1.50 in materials and labor and whatever to make per item, okay? So that's what translates to toys cost a buck fifty each to make. That's why it's multiplied by x, because x is the number of toys, and at a buck fifty a pop, how much is it costing me? The other one over here that doesn't have any x's next to it, that one is usually referred to as the fixed cost. Okay, so the fixed cost is separate than the variable cost because it doesn't matter how many toys I make, I'm always going to have to shell out $7.56, let's say, per month. That's usually related to your rent or something that's fixed. Maybe the equipment that I'm using is on loan and it costs me $756 um, per period, per month or quarter, year, whatever, in order to just be able to make toys. So even if I make absolutely no toys at all, it still costs me $7.56 because that's my fixed cost. Okay? And that's just the cost part of the situation. Mm, probably something you'd rather hear about 
is the revenue part. So how much am I going to sell these toys for? How much money am I going to make off these toys? Here, I said I'm going to sell them for $15 each. Okay, so now I'll go into my revenue, and I'll call that R of X. It's usually called R of X. Again, X is going to be the same thing, the number of toys, the number of items made, or in this case, sold. And let's say I'm going to sell these toys for $15 each. If they're, if they're going to sell for $15 each, what do you think my total revenue here will be as a function of X, the number of toys I sold? Write it down. 15 times X. That's right. That's what I was thinking because if I sell 10, I'll make 150. If I sell 1, I'll make $15. It's just $15 times how many I sold. So that's my revenue function. Again, it's linear, you can see, because it just has x to the first power. And then finally, profit. Whenever you figured out your cost and your revenue, your profit is simply going to be the difference between the two. And it's always revenue minus cost. Because revenue is money in, cost is money out that you had to pay. So the profit, usually denoted by P of X, is always going to be the amount of revenue you made and then subtracting away however much it costs you. Okay, that's a general rule, not necessarily just for linear functions, all functions in general. The profit is the difference between revenue and cost. So in this case, I'm going to copy down my revenue function here, 15X. I'm going to subtract away my cost function here, 756. And then I want to take this equation and I want to simplify it out, which is to say, factor through the negative sign here and combine like terms. The two like terms are both the terms with the x next to them. So you can see that's going to be 15x minus 1.5x. Be very careful here. A common mistake here is to forget to factor the negative sign through. Okay, so don't forget that. That's a negative 756. And then combining these two together, I'm going to get that my profit function is 13.5x minus 756. Okay, so that's going to be my profit function in dollars. All right, um, so that's just the setup of a problem from there. You can answer any questions someone's trying to throw at you or really make up your own questions about what you would care about. Um, one thing that I would really care about if I was trying to do this business is how many toys do I need to sell per month or whatever if this is my monthly fixed costs let's say how many toys do I need to break even you guys know what it means to break even that means that at least you made the money back that you invested in notice here that even if I don't make a single toy I had to pay 756 Okay, so I need to make enough revenue from this function here, sell enough of these toys to get that 756 back. Um, and that, val that level of toys is going to be my break-even point. So that's my question right now is, um, how many toys do I need to make and sell in order to break even? Again, the break-even point... is the point where the profit is exactly equal to zero, okay? Well, that doesn't sound that good, but then again, it's not that bad because at least the profit's not going to be negative. Keep in mind that if I rent this equipment and then don't make any toys, so I just make zero toys, let's see what happens. P, my profit, if I make zero toys, is going to be negative 756. So now I'm in the red. I just lost $756. Not good for business. So I want to know how many I need just to break even. Um, and that will be simply setting this equation for the profit function equal to zero. And then you see the familiar linear equation that you need to solve. So then you would bring the 756 over to the other side. Okay. And then you would divide by 13.5 in each case. And then the number I got there was x is equal to 56. So I got x is equal to 56 items right there. If I make and sell 56 items, 
then I will have broken even. At least I didn't lose any money, but then again, I didn't make any money. So now here's a good place to actually show you an application of an inequality instead of inequality, instead of an equality. What if I want to make money? For what range of number of toys, making and selling them, will I actually make a profit? So for what values of x will I make a positive profit? This has got to be a common question in business. Um, let's rephrase this in terms of mathematics and then we'll see how it solves out as an inequality statement. I want to make a positive profit and by that Mathematically speaking, I want P of X to be strictly greater than zero. That's a positive number. Zero is not a positive number. Um, so then if I change that equation there from equals zero to greater than zero, then I would get a similar statement. And I won't solve it out again because you're going to get a very similar answer if you solve it out. But this time, it's an inequality instead of an equality. We have x is strictly greater than 56, so to visualize that on a number line, here's making no toys, in which case I would lose $756. Here's me making and selling 56 toys, in which I've just broken even, I've just made my rent back, and here is the entire region in which I'm going to make a positive profit. Okay, so that's really my goal. That's where I'm going to want to be, is in that region right there. Okay, so hopefully everything is going all right so far. Now I'm going to go into a couple more um, applications which are a little more complicated, have a little bit more going on with them. Um, here's an example of an investment mix. Let's say I have a bunch of money to invest and I have all these different choices to invest them in. Some are going to be safer, some are going to be more volatile or riskier investments. And I want to make sure that I reach a goal of making a certain amount of money out of the money that I've invested. Okay, so let me set it up with a little bit. Let's say that I have uh, $100,000 to invest. It's quite a bit of money that I'd like to invest there. And my goal is to make $5,000 per year off of this investment. Okay? So I want to take that $100,000 and put it in uh, one or more different types of investment and I would like to come out with $5,000 in interest from my investments for each year that I'm doing this, uh, let's just keep it a little simple and say that we have two options. We have a savings account options. A savings account gives, let's say, 3.5% APY. And the APY, if you've never seen this before, you'll be seeing this um, a lot. This is annual percentage yield. So this goes hand in hand with the fact that I want to make this per year on an annual basis. Um, if I invested all $100,000 just into the savings account, I would get $3,500 in interest a year. $3,500 is not as big as $5,000, so I can't just use this to make my goal. I'm going to have to use something else too. Let's say we also have the option of a stock. And that gives 10% APY. Okay, so I have another stock option. If I put all 100000 in there at 10% APY, I would make $10,000 inside the year. Why don't I all just do that one? Why would I choose to mix between them? There's other lurking variables here that we're not going to consider because the mathematics would be too intense at this point. Um, the... The other thing is the risk involved, okay? Usually in a savings account, you are guaranteed to get that money. In a stock, let's say this is an average of 10%, but sometimes on a bad year, you might actually lose money, okay? So the stock is more volatile, and the savings account is safer. That's why we would like to diversify our portfolio by using a mix of the two, 
Okay. So I just want to figure out exactly how much money I should put in each one of these accounts so that I can come out with my goal, which is to make $5,000 per year in investments. Okay. Uh, geez, I haven't really written down many equations at all for you on this one. What are we going to do here? We're going to have to make up our own equations, and that has to do with what I want to know. I want to know how much money I should put in each one of these accounts. So that's a variable, and I will define my first variable, x, as the amount of money that I put, let's say, in the savings account. Okay? When you're inside a word problem, one of your very first steps is going to be to set up the word problem by defining exactly what you mean by your variables. So let's let x equal the amount of money that we put into the savings account. That's my first variable. Okay? Eventually, my goal will be to write down an equation that states how much money I'm going to make all together, and I want that to be $5,000 per year. This is just the starting point. If x is the amount of money that I put in the savings account, then how much money am I going to put in the stock? Then what, here, I want you to fill in the blank here, is the amount of money that I put into the stock. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video. Hopefully you're copying this down with some notes and fill in that blank for me. Okay, so what I got here is $100,000 minus X, the amount I have in the savings account. That's the statement I was looking for because remember, the $100,000 is how much total I have to invest. I already put X amount of it into the savings account, so the rest of it is going to go into my only other option, which was the stock. So the amount of money inside my stock is 100000 minus X. Once we have these two variables in place, we can now form an equation which states how much money we're going to make over the course of the year. And that has to do with the annual percentage yields on each one of these um, investment options. Okay, so we'll start with the savings account. Um, savings is going to give us some amount of money, plus the stock is going to give us some other amount of money, and we want that total amount of money that we make to equal $5,000. That's going to be our goal. Okay, so here I've put two words, savings, the amount of money I'm making off of savings, stock, the amount of money I'm making off of stock, and again, I'm going to put some blanks here, and I'd really like you to stop, pause the video, and fill in these blanks for me by using these percentages. That's your hint. You're going to incorporate these percentages and the variables that we just derived. Okay, so pause the video and now fill in those two blanks. Okay, so now let me show you what I was looking for here. X is the amount we have in savings. And at 3.5%, that means we will have X amount multiplied by that percentage rewritten as a decimal rate. Keep in mind that 100% is equivalent to 1.0. 10% is equivalent to 0.1. 3.5%, you always move the decimal over 2. So I have 0 0.035 times the amount that I've invested. I had to change this percentage into its equivalent decimal form by dividing by 100. That's how much I'm making off the savings account. Did you fill in the other blank too? How much I'm making off of the stock account is the amount of money I put into the stock multiplied by the rate as a decimal. And so hopefully you came up with that equation right there. The amount of money I put into the stock multiplied by the annual percentage yield as a decimal. Alright, now this may not look like it to you at first glance, but this actually is indeed a linear equation. This is linear equations in business because we have x to the first power here, we have x to the first power here. All we need to do is factor this guy through combine the like terms, and then come out with some statement, and then we can just solve it for x. Okay? So I'll rewrite this one as 0.035x, and this one I'm going to factor it through. 
I've got a negative 0 0.10 times x, and then I've got plus $10,000, and that's all equal to $5,000. All right, and then I'm going to want to combine these two numbers here, and that comes out as uh, negative 0.065x, and then I'll subtract 10,000 from both sides here, so I get a negative 5,000, okay? The next step will be to divide both sides of the equation by negative 0.065x. You can see it's going to work out okay because there's a negative on that side too. The negatives will cancel, and eventually I get the fact that x is equal to 76923.07693, which I'm just going to round off to the nearest cent. This is not the exact answer I got. This is the answer I got rounded off to the nearest cent. So I got x is equal to $76,923.08. And when I get there, I'm pretty happy with myself. I'm just going to pause and box that and think that's the answer. But is that the full answer to the question? The question really was how much should I invest in each account in order to make my goal of $5,000 per year? What is this number right here? It's actually only the amount that I'm investing into the savings account. Okay, so I got the answer that I should invest in the savings account. I should invest seven, six, nine, two, three, and eight cents. That should go right into savings. And then how much am I going to put into the stock account? I actually have to go back to my work. It's really good that I wrote down exactly what my variables were so I can go reference that later. And the amount of money that I put in the stock is $10,000 minus the investment that I put in the savings account. Okay, so then you crunch that in your calculator and you should get $23,076.92 is going to go into the stock account. So really both of these numbers combined make up the true answer of how much money I should put in each one of those accounts. How'd you guys feel about that problem? Was that a little complicated? I feel like at this stage, um, that might have been pretty complicated to figure all that out, which is why I've created a couple more examples of situations like that, and now I'd like you to try to work out some situations like that. Okay, so here's another one. I was just thinking of examples in business. Maybe I'm an employer, and um, because of my insurance and all that I have to pay for my employees, I can afford 20 employees per month. So here, let's say we have an employer can afford 20 employees per month. And let's say that my budget, actually my hourly and budget for employees is $510 per hour, okay? And can pay, I'm able to pay in total $510 per hour for all the employees. Okay, that's my total budget. I'm not just going to hire one guy for five, ten an hour. I want to have 20 employees, and let's say there's two different types of employees I can have. Um, let's say that I can have assistance, which costs $30 an hour. They get paid $30 per hour. And then trainees, which may not be as well trained as the assistants, trainees still in training, let's say they are doing the Seattle's minimum wage of $15 an hour, okay? So we have one level of employee assistance, which are $30 an hour, then we have another level, trainees, which are $15 an hour. As the employer, I would like to have a total of 20 employees. Of course, I would prefer to have all assistants because they are more well trained, but at $30 an hour, multiplied by 20 of them, that would be $600 an hour. I can't afford that. I can only budget $510 an hour for all my employees in general. How many can I get of each type? How many 
of each type can I hire? That's my question. All right. And there's a couple things we got to do before we can totally solve this out. Just like in the last problem you saw, um, the first two rows here were the definition of variables. If I want to answer the question, how many of each type can I hire, I really have two things that I need to have mathematical statements for. The number of assistants and the number of trainees. Okay? So I'm going to start out with a little bit of setup for this word problem. Let X be the number of assistants that I hire. Okay? And just like last time, I want you to fill in the blank. What's going to be here for the number of trainees that I'm going to hire? Go ahead and pause the video and fill in that blank for me right now. The mathematical expression I'm looking for there is that if I have x assistants and I have 20 all together, then 20 minus x will be the number of trainees that I have. Okay? And then once we have the setup of the number of assistants and number of trainees, then I can now make an equation which is going to say how much money I have to pay for assistance. So this is the cost of assistance. I'll make another expression for the cost to me as the employer of the trainees. And then the total cost, how much I can totally afford, is going to be $510. Just like with the last example, I'd like you to pause the video and fill in a mathematical expression for the cost of the assistance to me, the cost of the trainees to me, and then we will end up with a linear equation that solves out for the answer. Okay, so hopefully you um, were able to take this and combine it with this. Just like in the last example, the number of assistants is x, and assistants are costing me $30 per hour, so the hourly rate on all those is 30 times x. The hourly rate on the trainees is going to be $15 an hour, multiplied by the number of those, which is 20 minus x. Hopefully you kind of recognize the similarities between this problem and the problem we had previously. At this stage, we're, we are more than halfway done because we have an equation and it is a linear equation. We know how to solve it and we'll just solve it out for x and then we'll take that value of x and put it back in and figure out these numbers up here. Okay, the hardest part is behind us. The hardest part of this type of word problem is going to be to just set this up. Okay, so then the other part is the algebra of it where we have 30x and then 15 times 20 is 300. And 15 times negative x is negative 15x. That's equal to 510. All right. And um, I really hope that you're going to be playing along here. Pause the video. What value do you get for x? What value do you get for both of these? Now would be a good time for you to fill in these two blanks right here with your answer. And then unpause the video and I'll finish off the problem for you. Okay, so then the rest of that algebra is that I'm going to take the 30x and combine it with the like term of negative 15x. 30 minus 15 is 15x. Then I'm going to take this 300 and bring it over here by subtracting it. 510 minus 300 is going to equal to 210. And then the x value that I get here is x is equal to 14. Hopefully that's what you got too. I really hope that you're trying this along independently to make sure that you've got this. Um, x is equal to 14, and it's a good thing we still have our setup up here because then we know x was the number of assistants. We can have 14 of them, and so that means the leftovers, 20 minus 14, we will have 6 trainees. So that's good. At least we have uh, over twice as many assistants than trainees, so hopefully they can train them up. Okay. Are you feeling more comfortable with this type of problem now? I actually have one more example I came up with and um, maybe this time I'm just going to do the setup and then I'm going to ask you to pause the video and complete the problem, set up the problem, to see how comfortable you might be with this. 
Alright, um, this one's not necessarily business, this one's more related to real life. Let's say I'm in college and uh, uh, not only do I have to do all my homework, but i got to feed myself dinner every night. Okay, so I need seven dinners that I have to make or buy for myself per week. Okay, and I'm trying to save money by eating at home, but sometimes I just like to go out and buy a meal. So there's two different levels of ways that I can feed myself those seven dinners. If I make the dinner at home, let's say that the dinner is going to cost $6 per dinner. And if I eat that dinner out, if I go to a restaurant or something, on average the cost is actually going to be $15 for a nice dinner out. My question is, how many of each of these can I afford to do in a week if I have a given fixed budget? Let's say that my fixed budget is fixed at $60 per week. Okay, so I can spend $60 per week on dinner. At home, those are costing me six each. Out, they cost me 15 each. How many times Let's just get down to the real question I want. How many times can I eat out per week? Okay? How many times can I eat out per week? All right. Now you've seen me do two very similar word problems so far. It starts with a setup of let x equal something. Then, the other thing will have something to do with the x, and then, in all, we're going to get a linear equation that we set equal to some fixed number. In this case, we have a fixed budget of $60 per week. Okay? It's blank right now. I want you to pause the video and try to get through as much of this problem as you can by yourself to see how ready you are um, to attack this type of real-world situation. Okay, there's a couple different ways that you could approach this. You could either let x equal the number of at-home meals or x equals the number of eat-out meals and then the other one is going to be a function of x. So I'll just choose to do x is the number of at-home meals. Maybe you did it the other way. Either way that we've chosen it, we should get the same answer for this. I wonder what answer you got for that. Let x equal the number of at-home meals, and then the number of eat-out meals. Well, I've only got seven dinners per week, so if I'm eating x of them at home, then the rest of them I'm eating out, seven minus x of them I'm eating out per week. And those two lines combined are my setup. And then I can make a statement which says the cost of the home meals plus the cost of the eat out meals. How much money do I have to spend all together? I've budgeted $60 a week just for my dinners, so that's all going to equal to 60. So the third thing that I was really looking for in, um, in addition to these two lines here is going to be a statement that's equal to 60. In this case we have x eat out x at home meals at $7 each and then we have 7 minus x eating out meals at $15 each so hopefully you got something like this if you switch the definition of these two things then this would be a little switched around too but again we should all come to the same conclusion how many times can I eat out per week what did you get for that Okay, so let's finish off the problem with the algebra and see what we get from there. We've got 6x plus 15 times 7, and that is 105. And then we have minus 15x, that's equal to 60. Okay, don't forget to factor this through very carefully. And then we're going to combine like terms 16, uh, sorry, 6 minus 15 is a negative 9x. And then I'm going to subtract 105 from both sides. So on this side I have 60 minus 105, and that's negative 45. 
And so then from this line here, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 9, and I come to the conclusion that x is exactly equal to 5. Does that mean I get to eat out 5 times per week? No, it doesn't, because my x was number of at-home meals, okay? So I get to eat at home 5 times per week. Remember to correlate um, what you got for your answer with what your setup was for your variables. And 7 minus x is the number of eat-out meals, so how many times do I get to eat out per week? The answer is 2. 2 times per week. I'm probably sticking with Friday and Saturday. I'm going to get my meal out, and the rest of the time I'm going to eat at home. Okay, I hope you guys got those answers and you're feeling pretty comfortable with how linear equalities and inequalities are applied to business.